Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash, and I am at the moment situated in Vancouver, British Columbia, in the Canadian Pacific. Wonderful city with the same kind of weather we have in Great Britain. Rainy, damp, but not cold. I feel right at home. We've had a number of people contacting Moriel, not only recently, but over a period of time, concerning someone who I've only spoken to by telephone, and that was some years ago, Michael Brown. Now, I know people who know Michael Brown. We have a number of common acquaintances over quite a number of years, but I've never met him face to face. He's always reminded me of somebody who looks like Groucho Marx. I don't say that derogatorily. I'm a great fan of Groucho Marx. The only thing is Groucho Marx, with his comic genius, did not expect people to take him seriously. The other Groucho, Michael Brown, does. Let's begin at the beginning. Michael Brown. He gets a lot of attention in certain circles, messianic circles, sometimes discernment circles, other circles among charismatics and Pentecostals, and many people who avail themselves of our material are acquainted with him and avail themselves of his material. People want to know what I think, what my impression is, and a number of contact us, and they are concerned at times. I think it's about time I respond to this issue, but let's begin at the beginning. I'm reading, please, three passages of Scripture concerning the subject of false prophets. The first will be Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. We are told the following. Verse 21, you may say in your heart, how will we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not come about or come true, that is a thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him or lend credence to him or seeing him as having some kind of spiritual authority that he does not have. In the 13th chapter of Deuteronomy, what we call in Hebrew, Devarim, it is those who point you to other gods with some kind of a prophetic revelation or a claimed one. But here it is speaking to those who worship the true God. How do you know a false prophet among those who profess to worship the true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? That is as we know, the triune God of Israel, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ha'av ha'ben the Haruach Kodesh. How do we know? Well, they make predictive prophecies in the name of the Lord that failed to happen. And those who lend credence to them, those who pay attention to them, those who follow them, those who ascribe any kind of power to them, are in rebellion against the Lord. You are in rebellion against the Lord if you lend credence to somebody who predicts things in the name of the Lord that failed to happen. Now, in Old Testament Israel, this would be a capital crime. They would be subject to death by execution. Of course, under the New Covenant, we're under grace, not law. But the sin is no less serious. Simply, the Lord Jesus went to the cross to pay for the sin instead of the person being stoned for their own. That's the difference, theologically. But the crime, and it's a crime, it's not just a sin, it was a crime. A capital crime is no less serious. Under grace, if somebody repents of it, they will stop doing it. They will stop professing to have a prophetic message or a prophetic ministry. And they will accept the ramifications and consequences of their false prophetic activities. Nonetheless, someone who predicts things in the name of the Lord that failed to happen are by definition a false prophet, which in Old Testament Israel was a capital crime. And those who lend credence to them, pay attention to them, are supportive of them or their ministry, are in rebellion against the Lord. The second thing we see concerning false prophets in the New Testament is in the Olivet Discourse. The Lord Jesus, Yeshua, speaking of the last days, 
echoes the message of the prophet Jeremiah from chapter 23 in Jeremiah, Yermiyahu <clears> Hanavi. <throat> and Jesus makes it clear in verse 24 of Matthew 24 that false prophets will arise. False prophets will arise. Some of them even performing what we call in Hebrew, Nesim Vaniflaot, signs and wonders. That is manifesting what we would call charismatic phenomena, supernatural phenomena. Their numbers would increase in the last days before the Lord Jesus Yeshua returns. The third thing I'd like to look at in the New Testament concerning false prophets, how we are to observe this problem and phenomena from the perspective of New Testament Christianity, is in 2 Peter chapter 2. First one, but false prophets will also arise among the people, as there will also be false teachers among you. We've pointed out a number of times that it is impressive that Peter treats false prophets and false teachers as if they were synonymous. He uses the terms virtually interchangeably. Someone's prophecies are going to be wrong if their doctrines are wrong. If someone's teaching is wrong, that is the underlying reason that their prophetic pronouncements are going to be wrong. People with false teaching will have false prophecies, Peter tells us. And they will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction destruction upon themselves. Many, many will follow in their sensuality, and because of them the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. We see the motive of a false prophet is greed. You can virtually replace the term P-R-O-P-H-E-T with P-R-O-F-I-T. False prophets are out to make a profit. It is their business. It is an industry. It is their trade. It is their racket. We also see that they, in some cases, will deny the master who bought them. One case of this would be people like Kenneth Copeland and others who followed the teaching of the late E.W. Kenyon, influenced by William Branham, uh, the late Kenneth Hagin, and so forth, where they say Jesus died spiritually, that Satan got the victory on the cross, and that Jesus had to be tortured three days and three nights in hell and had to be born again in hell, as opposed to the true master who on the cross said, it is finished, Telestai. But we also see that those who are swayed by them are swayed by false prophets on the basis of sensuality, of sensuality. They mistake feelings, emotional charge, religiosity with spirituality. They have a pseudo-spirituality based on senses, based on emotions, based on feelings, which predisposes them to the deception. So we have three major factors in understanding false prophets in the time in which we live. One, they predict something or some things in the name of the Lord that do not happen, that are in some way time-specific. Two, their numbers increase in the last days before Jesus returns. And three, they secretly introduce destructive heresies. Now this term is what I'd like to focus on. It's not an easy term to translate from Greek, but it makes perfect sense if you know Greek. Para sogzusin, para sogzusin. They put truth next to error. False prophets have false doctrine, but they place true doctrine next to it. They make an arsenic sandwich making sure there's plenty of mustard or mayonnaise on the pumpernickel bread and salt beef and whatever else you like, just a small amount of arsenic. They secretly introduce the arsenic into the corned beef sandwich. 
This is what it is. They put truth next to error. They use things and say things that are true doctrinally, that are scriptural, in order to masquerade or camouflage the lie. Parasogzusin. That is how false prophets operate. Now, when you have people who are predisposed by a pseudo-spirituality, a sensuality, and they see people saying things that are scripturally true, they become easy prey to these predators, these false prophets. Oh, he says good things, she says good things, they say true things. That's what false prophets do. They put truth next to error. But let's look at the issue today. Michael Brown, point one. I had been scheduled to debate Michael Brown when he was the apologist for the Pensacola counterfeit revival, the American version of the counterfeit revival from Toronto, Canada, that came about in Pensacola, Florida. It, of course, ended in a scandal. It ended in a split that was very public and very ugly involving the Assemblies of God leadership and the time of Dr. Trask and so forth. And John Kilpatrick and Michael Brown was caught in the middle of it and it was a very ugly falling out. There were revelations of the vibrating girl who they paraded as proof God was working and she was sort of palsied and speaking with a stuttering speech. And Mr. Kilpatrick said, I know this is of God because I know her family. She comes from a good family, her parents being professional people and so forth, when in fact she came from a broken home. Then there became the financial issues and associated arguments, and then it all split and broke down into nothing. Pensacola came to nothing. The apologist for Toronto was Guy Chevro, who wrote the book Catch the Fire. His American equivalent was Michael Brown, who wrote the book, Let No One Deceive You, as the apologist for Pensacola, another failed revival. No revival came from Pensacola. I was saved in a revival among the hippies, among the Jesus freaks, when God moved among the hippie generation. I remember guys coming back from Vietnam strung out on heroin. They were needing 100, 120 milligrams of methadone a day from the VA clinics in New York and Los Angeles, not to go completely ballistic. And they were being set free and delivered by the power of Jesus. Not one here, one there, many of them, many. I saw people totally into the counterculture of not just dope sex and rock and roll, but psychedelic mysticism, chemically in, in, induced occult experiences with LSD and so forth, seeing through that demonic deception and coming to faith in Jesus in huge numbers, not just in one location, but all over the world. Thousands and thousands and thousands. 30,000 Jewish hippies were saved in California in one year. 30,000 Jewish hippies were saved in California in one year. It is estimated by the people who were active at that time Jews for Jesus came out of that movement at that time in both New York and on the West Coast of America. Calvary chapels came out of that movement with Chuck Smith and so forth. Now there were some bad groups, there were some cult groups like the Children of God where I was saved in, in Greenwich Village in Manhattan and on McDougal Street, but there were good groups and good people and good ministries. And the effects of that revival are still with us today. A generation later, so many of the people professing to be born-again Christians or churches professing to be evangelical had roots in the Jesus movement. It was a real revival. I speak in places in the third world where there is genuine revival. Even in the place of persecution, there are places where there's genuine revival. When you've seen a real revival, a real revival, we have a children's mission in the Philippines. Can you imagine planting a church in the Philippines among poor people? Within 18 months, there are 200 adult members, not from transfer growth, they were all saved, all born again. And within 18 months, that church with 200 people had planted five other churches with at least 200 people each. 
That's revival. There are revivals happening today in the developing world, not much in the developed world except among the gypsies in Europe, being an exception. When you see a real revival, you know what revival is, but you also know what revival is not. Toronto, Pensacola, these fiascos were not revival. They can't be. <clears throat> the fruit of the Spirit, we are told twice in the New Testament, is ikrete, self-control. You saw people on the floor having conniptions and drunken hysterics that were out of control. And this was even promoted and paraded in Pensacola, for which Michael Brown had been the apologist. A pastor in New Jersey at the New Jersey Shore, Brick, New Jersey, was a pastor called Pastor Dick Fisher, a Baptist, who arranged a debate between myself and Michael Brown to take place in New Jersey. The reason being, Michael Brown was very much brandishing his messianic Jewish identity as the apologist. There were other Jews involved in these counterfeit revivals, particularly someone called Dick Rubin, but Michael Brown was the star attraction playing the messianic card. I lived in Israel, and I had just come to England, where I was going to seminary, and after seminary is when these things happened in Toronto and Pensacola. Well, <clears throat> I was to come and debate him and the agreement was it would take place midweek at a neutral venue so people could attend their own churches on Sunday and it would be on neutral turf. That was the agreement organized by Pastor Fisher. Pastor Fisher co-authored the book The Strange World of Benny Hinn. Now he wanted me for a couple of reasons. One of which is Michael Brown has a genuine doctorate in Hebrew from New York University. <clears throat> I was saved practically on the campus of New York University on McDougal Street. And I spoke the Hebrew, I speak the Hebrew language. That is why they wanted me to debate him. Additionally, I am not a cessationist. Like Michael Brown, I would profess to be something closer to Wesleyan Armenian, and I would believe the gifts of the Spirit, including the charismatic gifts, still continue to operate in the church. I would maintain most of what we see today is not authentic. Most of what's being called tongues is gibberish. Most of what's being called prophecy is clairvoyance. But I do not deny what's in Scripture, and I do not believe these things ended with the apostles. I do not believe that those beliefs held by people like John MacArthur are exegetically sustainable. By both theology and experience, I am doctrinally someone who believes in the charismatic gifts. I just don't believe in charismania, the theological term of which is neo-Montanism. And that's what Pensacola was. It was neo-Montanism, charismania, not charismata. Nonetheless, they wanted someone who knew Hebrew, and they wanted someone who was Wesleyan Arminian and who held to beliefs in things like spirit baptism, scripturally understood, and who was not a cessationist. Because the Pensacola people were trying to misrepresent those opposing Pensacola as being cessationist or reformed or Calvinist, and they could just write them off as not being baptized in the Spirit or not believing in the gifts. They wanted someone who knew Pensacola was counterfeit, but who was not a cessationist. They came up with me. I agreed. It was the summer, the summer holiday and vacation season. But that particular summer, there was a problem. British Airlines had a strike. So all the other airlines flying transatlantic from Great Britain to the United States, I lived in Britain at the time, um, <clears throat> were almost impossible to get seats. Somehow, my travel agent in Leeds, England at the time, uh, I had been doing postgraduate studies at, at Cambridge University and at London School of Theology at the time. Be that as it may, the travel agent got tickets for my family and myself. I was bringing my wife and at that time my younger children with me, making it an opportunity for them to visit family in the New York, New Jersey area. So we got the flights, we got the tickets despite the airline strike. <clears throat> we are then notified quite probably after Michael Brown knew that I had video footage of what was really happening in Pensacola, that he was canceling the scheduled debate 
and demanding it rather be held not at a neutral venue, but at a pro-Pensacola church on a Sunday night instead of midweek as we agreed. He moved the goalpost. He wanted to stack the deck, load the dice. And it would have been impossible during the summer vacation season with the British Airlines strike for me to change my tickets. I couldn't do it. It was impossible. It was very difficult for my travel agent to get me the tickets we had. This was Michael Brown. Another person I was scheduled to debate not too long after that was a rabbi called Shmulek Boteak. Having done my postgraduate studies in Judaism at Cambridge, the Lachaim Society of Great Britain was based in Cambridge, and I was to debate Rabbi Shmulek Boteak. On 48 hours' notice, he also canceled the debate. But he and Michael Brown would debate each other in what almost became a medicine show comedy routine. Groucho Marx and Chico or whatever it was, but it became something that was no longer doctrinally and theologically serious in the opinion of most people I know who'd seen this series of debates. The first one was okay, but after that it degenerated into something that was not serious. Now let me say this. At one time our ministry, Moriel, we actually sold a paperback book by Michael Brown called Our Hands Are Stained With Blood. The book was easy to read and it was a polemic against Christian anti-Semitism. We were not against Michael Brown. We actually sold one of his books at one particular time. I had no personal hostility towards him. He was from New York City like me, etc., etc. Hebrew background and so on, linguistically and so on. So <clears throat> this was my experience with Michael Brown and his assistant named Scott. It was not happy when that debate was, was canceled. And he was demanding that it be rescheduled on terms favorable to people who were already bought into the Pensacola lie, deception, counterfeit revival. Well, let me begin at the real beginning. Before I came to seminary in England, I lived in Israel for a number of years. I had co-led a congregation, did evangelism, things like that. And uh, I'd, I'd been to university, but I'd not been to seminary as yet. I was getting ready to come to seminary. But there was a Messianic conference in Jerusalem attended by a number of people who I knew or knew of. My friend Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum was there. Joel Chernoff, who had been in the uh, music, Messianic music combo uh, called... Uh, Lamb was there. There were other people there from Israel. A number of people were there. Don't take my word for it. At this particular time, there was a disaster in Israel. A disaster. It was called the Sharaf from the Hebrew infinitive Yisrof to burn. 22% of Israel's reforested land was destroyed in forest fires deliberately set by radical Islamic terrorists. Now you have to understand something about Israel. For years it was either malaria infested swamps or desert. It was the Zionists in the Aliyah, first Aliyah, second Aliyah, who re-irrigated the land and planted the trees. The Israeli Arbor Day, Tu Bishvat, is a big, big holiday observed by school children and Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and community groups, it's a big deal because the reforestation of the nation represents the nation, the land coming back to life under Jewish control after centuries as a barren wasteland. To understand what it was like before the Aliyah, you can look at the Prince of David Roberts, the favorite, fa famous prince still available on the internet, or you can read the descriptions by the American author, Mark Twain. It was not a happy place. It was a barren, desolate, nearly treeless place until the Aliyah and the land began to become reforested. Not only that, but the national forests of Israel, such as the Carmel Forest and others, and the memorial for forests near Jerusalem, trees were planted in memory of families who were 
exterminated by the Nazis in the Holocaust. The trees were memorials. There were trees planted by pro-Zionist Christian groups in memory of Christians who saved Jews during the Holocaust, things like this. It was a lot to do with Holocaust memorial. It was a lot to do with being nationally emblematic of the rebirth of the land. And it was sacrosanct in popular, and it is sacrosanct in popular Jewish culture around the theme of the two Bishvat. Still like that. But these terrorists attacked this national symbol of the rebirth of the Jewish land by forest fires, incendiary attacks launched by radical Islamic terrorists. 22% of Israel's forests were destroyed. 22%. In proportionate terms, that's worse than any of these terrible forest fires we've seen in California in the San Bernardino Mountains and San Gabriel Mountains. Those have been terrible fires. The bushfires around Sydney, Australia have been terrible over the years and the Blue Mountains. But in proportionate terms, what happened in Israel was worse. It was a national disaster to shut off. Can you imagine a Jewish believer coming to Jerusalem, looking out the window, and all the smoke is there, and the newspapers and the headlines are talking about this national disaster and these fires out of control? Firefighters were killed. Israeli soldiers augmenting the fire departments were killed. There was all kinds of pulmonary damage from smoke inhalation, and there were threats to the outlying neighborhoods of Haifa and Israel when the Carmel forest was burning down in northern Israel and Galilee. It was terrible. It was really, really terrible. Uh, and it was a terrorist attack. Can you imagine a believer, someone saying they're a believer in Yeshua as the Messiah, saying, the Holy Spirit showed me that this is God pouring out his Holy Spirit fire on Israel. A disaster, a national disaster, a terrorist attack. Destroying 22% of the national forests, claiming the lives of sold young soldiers, forest rangers, and, and, and firemen. That's the Holy Spirit's fire. What kind of a maniac would say that? Can you imagine someone saying the September 11th attacks in New York when my sister's husband was killed? Was God doing some blessing? Just Islamic terror. So here he comes. Who said that? Dr. Michael Brown. Then there's the Messianic Conference. Well attended. I was in Israel. I know people who were there. They heard it. They witnessed it. I defy him to deny it. He made a predictive prophecy in the name of the Lord that a second Pentecost event was going to transpire at this conference, that the Holy Spirit was going to fall somehow as he did on the day of Pentecost, Hag Shavuot, in the book of Acts, chapter 2. People were up. Some believed him. Some said he was crazy. They were up into the night waiting for this event to happen that he predicted in the name of the Lord was going to happen. He said in the name of Yeshua, in the name of Jesus, by the Spirit of the Lord, he claimed, that there was going to be another Pentecost. Now understand, much of the Messianic movement is run by crackpots. The same as you have serious Messianic Jewish scholars, a great tradition going back to Alfred Edersheim and, and, and to David Barron and to Franz Delich, all the way forward to the more modern Dr. Lewis Goldberg from Moody Bible Institute or Dr. Michael Rodelnik from Moody or Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum. That's the serious Messianic scholarship. Then you've got the crackpots the Neo-Galatians trying to put Gentiles under the law and all sorts of other things. 
And you have the lunatic fringe, Neomontanist, the Dick Rubens, the, the Sid Roths, people from the lunatic fringe. Here is the oddity of Michael Brown. He has an actual doctorate in Hebrew from NYU. At NYU is a guy I met in Australia from the Dead Sea Scrolls Commission, Dr. Larry Fishman. These are serious scholars. Michael Brown is not an idiot. He's not a stupid person. He's not a, 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 a charlatan. He actually does have a doctorate in Hebrew. He's not like these crackpots in terms of his education. But he behaves like the crackpots instead of like the scholars. Go figure. By scriptural definition, he's a false prophet. It didn't happen. And what's odd is when he would stick to what God called him to do, when he would stick to messianic apologetics and Jewish evangelism, he could be quite effective. He could be effective as a voice in opposing Christian anti-Semitism, so-called Christian, Christian with a small c. He has gifts, he has abilities, he has intelligence, he has education in the Hebrew language. He has a certain amount of theological wherewithal. These things he's plummeted into with false doctrine and false prophecy are beneath him, at least beneath him intellectually but they should be beneath him spiritually, but they're not. By definition, he's a false prophet, a man with an actual doctorate in Hebrew. Lefia Torah Denel, who never sheker, who never sheker mamash, who ba lazot b'shem Hashem, sheha rok hudesh gibor, כמו בחג שבועות, עוד פעם, בירושלים באיזה כנס, וזה לא קרה, לא קרה לגמרי. הוא נווה שקר. By the definitions of the Hebrew scripture and the word of God, he's a false prophet. And those who follow him, who lend credence to him, who are supportive of his ministry, are in direct rebellion against the Word of God. Jesus is the Word, the Logos, the Mamra, the Devar Adonai incarnate. Those who will follow a false prophet are rejecting not only the warnings, but the commands of the Lord Yeshua, of Jesus. This is Michael Brown. This, however, was only the beginning of his shameful antics. It continues through the Pensacola fiasco, which ends in a split and a very ugly public argument in which he was not only implicated, but played a central role. Let's move on even further. More recently, he was singing the praises of the Gnostic mysticism taking place at Bethel, California, in the ministry of Bill Johnson. He was good with those guys. Let's watch what he was endorsing, sanctioning. And the Holy Spirit to me is like the genie from Aladdin. I view the Holy Spirit like the genie from Aladdin. And he's blue. Unplanned, perfect. And he's funny and he's sneaky. Is it okay if I touch you? Is it okay if I lay hands on you while I'm talking to you? I saw a wave of worship. I saw a wave of worship hitting, hitting you. Yeah. I saw, I saw that there was no separation from worship in the church to the streets. Whoa! We just saw, I just saw it. Whoo, it's this like extravagant, uncontainable worship it's like a fire yeah mama we bless you mama we bless you whoa yeah and i just whoo you'll be known that's who he is to me and he's funny and he's sneaky he's silly he's wonderful 
and I view him like the genie from Aladdin. <laughs> he's just fun. And he's blue. Wow! Then let's watch what Michael Brown himself perpetrated in Pensacola and elsewhere. Watch the clip of Bethel and watch the clip of Michael Brown. Friends, many people are taken in by him seemingly. Yes, he has spoken out on issues where I would speak out, homosexuality among them. He's spoken out against anti-Semitism, and rightly so. He's spoken out in the area of messianic apologetics, bringing critical arguments supporting the messiahship of Yeshua. He is classic parasogzusin. He puts truth next to error. He says true things to sugarcoat the false things. He does true things that he preaches and states in order to camouflage the lie. That is how false prophets operate. They put truth next to to error. Mashe nochon, mashe amet, bediyuk al yad, mashe lo nochon, velo amet, shekrim mi oevenu. I'm sure Dr. Brown can translate that for you. This is what you are dealing with. The man is a proven false prophet. He is unrepentant. Had he repented, he wouldn't be perpetuating these antics and these ridiculous things he does, these things he sanctions that are not of God. Now again, I am not a cessationist. I am not reformed. I am none of that. But Michael Brown is not a scriptural charismatic. He's a charismaniac. You saw the clips. He's a neo-Montanist. And he's a false prophet. My name is Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for listening. Shmiyako Pras to Dalahem.